if you're looking to buy or sell, call me, then I'm gonna miss out. No, you dug into that community and you're still selling real estate all over the place. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Real Estate Show. I'm Tiffany Weber, real estate attorney at Thomas & Weber in Morrisville and Huntersville, North Carolina. And today I am joined by a special guest, Daniela Pereira, better known in the streets as Danny P. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank Before you. I have you tell a little bit about yourself, I just want to say, um, I've, it hasn't been that long since I first met you, but every time I talk to you, I come away feeling so encouraged and excited about the people that get to work with you and also just the future of our industry. So you're a yeah. breath of fresh air and I'm so excited to have you. Well, today. that means a lot to me. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here and happy to be chatting with someone as special as you. Oh my gosh. You're too kind. Thanks. Um, so one thing I really want to know is what brought you to real estate? Because you're, you strike me as somebody that's like a woman of many, many talents. So you could pick whatever you want to do and you chose intentionally to do this. So tell me about your background and what got you to this career. Yeah. So real estate actually encompasses everything I love to do. And I didn't know that until my mid twenties. I think I was 25 when I figured it out. But, um, to backtrack a bit, I have a degree in cinema and television arts and so I this did set, you're <laughs> this like, set. Okay, this I, I'm amazed. <laughs> I love it. Love the cameras. Love the lighting. Um, but yeah, I I used to live in LA for a while, and I worked in the TV and film industry, and mm -hmm. that's where it is. So I did all of that, and then I realized, okay, I love this stuff. I'm not passionate about it mm. enough to devote my life to it because oh. it is an entire lifestyle. Yeah. And you work until the shot is perfected. Mm -hmm. And that is however many hours it takes. perfection is also subjective, too. Exactly. <laughs> and however many hours that takes, however many days. So anyway, I realized that there was no upward mobility for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a very impatient person. So I thought it was cool, awesome, but decided to tap into marketing instead. Okay. Um, and then I did have a minor in business. Um, in college. So Doesn't kind, of, me. kind of related, right? I, I do wish now that I had majored in business, but anyway. So the point is I leave LA and I moved to Charleston, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And I started working at a marketing firm and I loved the client relationships. I was in an account management role mm -hmm. and client relationships was definitely my jam. I absolutely loved it. I loved figuring out what a client needs and putting a a plan of action together from point A to point B, C, and so on and so forth. It's coming and together for me. I'm seeing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And then really just producing the journey. Mm -hmm. So um, I love that part of it, but I missed the storytelling aspect mm. of TV and film. And I'm like, all right, great. I just moved my whole life and I now miss what I had before, but I don't miss all of it. And, and, you know, it was a period of just trying to figure out what works best for me. Yeah. Um, like that self-discovery time of your life. Yes. And I do remember living in Charleston, South Carolina, it is such a touristy spot. Mm -hmm. And I would see these tour guides all around downtown Charleston. And I lived downtown. I would walk to work sometimes and I would just pass all these tourists thinking, Gosh, I used to love it when I was a tour guide in college. Mm -hmm. And, and that you went to was, college in North Carolina, yes, right? Yes, I went to college in North Carolina, Elon University. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love Elon. Shout out to Elon. <laughs> um, it really changed my life um, in every way. And so I remember living in Charleston thinking, oh, these tour guides, these are real life tour guides, mm -hmm. as if college wasn't real life, but adults. These yes. are adult tour guides. How cool. Yeah. And then I find out... Um, you know, the income that you can make as a, as a tour guide in Charleston, South Carolina. And I realized, oof, that, that doesn't give me the, Maybe the resources. Maybe it can't be that my I profession. <laughs> exactly. It didn't give the resources that I needed for my life at the time. So I'm thinking if I could just go back to college and be a tour guide for the rest of my life, I think I would be great. So anyway, um, long story short, I, I ended up meeting my ex-partner in Charleston, um, who to this day I'm very grateful for because he introduced me to real estate. Mm. And um, so I would tell him, you know, I'm not happy with my job. I miss storytelling. I like client relationships. I miss tour guiding. I miss just showing something that I'm proud of mm. and, and helping you understand that going through this experience with me is what's special. Mm -hmm. Because when I would give tours at Elon, 
the students wanted to be in my shoes. They wanted to do all of the activities that I would do on campus. Mm -hmm. And then when they would end up becoming students at Elon the following semester or the following year, and they would see me on campus, they would stop You're me and say, Daniela, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> yeah. They'd be like, Daniela, I'm doing X, Y, and Z that you told me about. And and they were they were wanting to step into my life. Mm -hmm. And so me showcasing something that I was proud of and that I loved, and it was it was the, jo the journey of doing it together, mm -hmm. um, that excited me. So anyway, I... I was, you know, in this relationship with this person who introduced me to real estate because he had uh, investment properties. Mm -hmm. And I used to hear some of the conversations that he would have with realtors on the phone. And, and I started to get interested mm -hmm. by it. And then eventually um, he was also in the military and he got orders to relocate to Delaware for the Air Force. And so at that time, we sat down and, and made a plan and decided that I was going to quit marketing and that I was going to go into real estate. I had heard enough yep. and I was excited about it. And, you know, I got the little bug. So yeah. um, primarily went into real estate because of the tour guide aspect yes. of it. But I had never um, until you're saying this, I'd never really thought about it that way. But it makes perfect sense. There's something that. Um, there's an author that Ryan and I really like a lot and um, like his storytelling style. And he wrote a book called Story Brand. His name's Donald Miller. And he talks about how, like, make the client the hero of their own story and you be the trusted guide. And you're basically talking about, like, even if you've never read that book, you're kind of talking about that right now of how That's you're funny. you're showing someone the life that they can have yeah. if they take this step or if they make this decision or... Um, so I really love that you liken real estate to kind of being a tour guide. Yay. Thank you. Yeah, that's fun. No, um, I, I do. I do love the field. I love um, everything that it offers me. I love what it offers my clients and what it offers our economy, our society in general. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I went into it possibly for the wrong reasons, thinking, oh, this is going to be a fun thing that I can do maybe part-time, maybe full-time, but I'll show pretty homes and I'll tour pretty homes myself. And and so I didn't realize just the complexities of it at the mm -hmm. time that I decided to go into this field. But once I make a decision, I'm loyal to it and I'm devoted to it. And so, you know, I, I rolled with the punches of whatever else came and mm -hmm. there was a lot of schooling and licensing and learning and processing and you're building an entire business, but most importantly, you're branding yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I understood within a few months of, of tapping into this industry, I understood that this was my opportunity to not only be a tour guide for homes, but for the city that I lived in, but also tell the story of me, tell the story of us, help you build the story of your home mm -hmm. and help you in any transition in your life and be a part of that. Um, and also it was a business, right? I mean, yeah. I, I, there is so much upward mobility in a business. The more I work, the more I earn, mm -hmm. the more I devote myself to it, the more resources I have. Mm -hmm. This was my chance to break free from a schedule that someone else gives me or tasks that someone else gives me. And yes, I do complete tasks for my clients that they put on my plate, but it just feels different mm -hmm. because I do it in the way that I want to, in the mm -hmm. way that I have offered you, I'm going to show up for you. And I add my own charm and twist to it. Yeah. And so, they're your clients, not someone else's clients that you were assigned to take care of. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's that autonomy and and owning something. And, you know, there have been times where I've, I've called myself controlling and, and yeah, I am. I, I, I am like too. to control. Me too, girl. <laughs> I like to control because I, I love the process of just building something and knowing that I can trust the outcome mm -hmm. because I did it exactly the way I wanted it to be. Yeah. That's, um, I can hear the passion when you speak and, you know, I do real estate closing. So I interact with thousands of agents a year and so many of them are just checking a box you know they they see you know you're describing your motives for becoming a real estate agent because it fits the things that you're passionate about your skill set and at the time that you got into it it fit the life that you needed to create mm -hmm. 
but there are so many other agents I hear that they get like, they hear some buzzwords and they're like, cool, this is going to be super easy. And I'm just going to make a bunch of money super fast and have all this free time. And so I see them at the closing table and they're just miserable because they didn't realize, oh, this is a profession. And if I want to do it well, I'm, I'm basically getting a whole nother degree and constantly learning and, I need to know how to, I need to be business savvy. I need to understand client relationships and, and psychology and all of these things. Um, And I don't hear that in you. I hear somebody who like, yeah, you saw it as a good lifestyle move for you at the time, but you also had all of the pieces of the puzzle and you put them together to make a life that serves you and that you're really happy about. Thank you. I appreciate that. I am very happy. I will say this is the stage of life that I enjoy the most. Um, I am now 30 years old, so it's been five years since I started this journey, and I don't plan on ever stopping. Mm-hmm. And maybe I'll shift gears within the realm of real estate, and I already have. Um, so I started out as a real estate agent in the state of Delaware mm-hmm. and then ended up moving out of Delaware. Um, the relationship that I mentioned ended and I moved back to what I consider my hometown, which is Charlotte. Mm-hmm. And in Charlotte, I became a real estate broker. Mm-hmm. And um, then I ended up buying a couple of homes and I'm now a landlady. So casual. <laughs> I ended up just buying a couple of homes. <laughs> no. Well, it, it was a lot more than that, but um, I'll, I'll but spare it's you the details. It's humility. It's, that's, that's what it is. You're being very oh, humble about thank it. You. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I, I ended up, what I mean to say is that I, I bought my homes in Charlotte because I plan to stay in Charlotte. Mm-hmm. And so I bought a home, lived in it for a year, then decided to buy another, both of them new construction um, so I got to see the whole process from, yes. from start to finish, literally from scratch. Yeah. Um, and I absolutely love new construction. And anyway, moved into the next house and then started renting out the first. So um, I've already tapped into various aspects of, of real estate, you know, selling homes, but also building a business and also owning property and being an investor and mm-hmm. um, tapping into different parts of it and, and putting it all under one umbrella. And it's still the, the umbrella of, of me in real estate mm-hmm. in, in any way, shape or form. And separately from that, uh, in late 2022, I launched another business and it kind of came from me just winging something. Um, it's a workshop. It's called okay. Dare to Jump, How to Mitigate Self-Sabotage in Business. And I, like I started this. hosting this workshop in different entrepreneurial settings. And after a few times, it became a paid opportunity for me. Mm-hmm. So I can now say I am a paid speaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's not necessarily directly related to real estate, the workshop itself, but it's a business, business mindset, business mm-hmm. sabotage and how to mitigate it mm-hmm. and, and taking a, a chance for yourself. And it does... Um, build another side of me that that feeds my real estate business and absolutely and ends up joining forces so Mm -hmm. anyway real estate has given me an opportunity to to just draft my life however I want it to be Mm -hmm. um and see it all play out um now could I ever exit the world of real estate? Honestly, probably not. (laughs) It'd be really hard to extricate yourself at this point. Yes, because I think there's so much that I could do with it. I mean, if I become interested in design, let me just go be a home designer. Or if I become interested in architecture, it's all under real estate regardless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's so much that you learn in those critical first years. And one thing I like is that you've, you've done the property ownership thing and not just at for your primary residence. And I'm not suggesting at all that an agent to be good at their job has to own property, but it gives you a different level of understanding. And, you know, it helps soothe some of the concerns that your buyers or sellers may have because you might have had the same experience as them, you know, being a landlady and their tenants calling and they've got a leaky faucet. What do you do? And you can say, well, when it happened to me, and that makes them feel so much better and more connected to you and, you know, just a different way to you 
for you to be a counselor to them through the process. So just it does. It's been cool, especially in my community. So both of my homes are in the same neighborhood, Mm -hmm. same builder. Um, The community is still being built out. I bought the first home in phase one, the second home in phase two. And also I like that one and one, two and two. Yeah. (laughs) And it was a great move for equity, too. You know, Mm -hmm. you get into a community at the beginning of it. And by the time I closed on each of those homes, the the instant equity that I already had was amazing. So and and it just keeps going up. But um, I I started the Facebook group from a community and I started hosting socials and I decided this is going to be my place. And Mm -hmm. and I'm going to infiltrate this place, not only because I want to make friends and I want to have a sense of community here, but also because I am fully confident that I am the most devoted agent anyone could have. And I'm not saying that I am the the biggest expert or the most knowledgeable or the one with the best experience. I'm the most devoted. Mm -hmm. And that level of devotion can supersede experience or knowledge Mm -hmm. Because even if I don't know the answer to something, I will find it. Yeah, it's, and it's a commitment beyond just, I've got your back. It's like, no, we'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes. And here's the thing. I, I decided to build this presence in my, in my own neighborhood because I own my homes there, because mm-hmm. I know the whole process, because I know the builder and the HOA and everything. And, and I want people to, to trust me to represent them when they're purchasing homes in this neighborhood, but mm-hmm. also... If they meet me after and they decide to buy another home later, they can trust me to do that with them. And it's already happening. Mm -hmm. It's now been about a year and a half since I entered this community. And I have had various clients in the community already. I've represented various buyers. Mm -hmm. um, And I've also done rental listings for people who have decided to leave the community, buy another home with me and list their home for rent with me as well. Mm And so it just provides opportunity for, yeah. for everyone. And yeah, you're like, you're hitting on this thing that, uh, that Ryan talks about a lot whenever he gives marketing seminars to agents. Um, and it's that a lot of agents are afraid of getting really specific because they think it's going to shut out opportunities elsewhere. And you're just the prime example. What you just said display so clearly. Why do you, why to get specific? You have become the agent for that community. You know it inside and out. And everybody knows you as the agent for that community. But it has not foreclosed you from opportunities in other communities. Because those people, like you said, are going to sell. And then you're going to help them buy elsewhere. And they're going to tell their friends about you. So it's when you can find an audience that's kind of captive and get them hooked, then it doesn't shut you out from the rest of the world. It just helps you really get specific and find an audience and get them to engage and then get those referrals elsewhere. So I'm really glad you talked about that because it's so hard to break down that concept of like, oh, but if I'm not saying, if you're looking to buy or sell, call me, then I'm going to miss out. No, you you dug into that community and you're still selling real estate all over the place. So I love Definitely. that. Yeah. I love the way you put that. Yes, thank you. And I appreciate that. Everything you're saying in response to, to my experience feels like a compliment to me. So <laughs> well, honestly, because you, you're doing so well. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And and I cannot say it enough. Um, I, I have learned that compliments don't always have to be Uh, answer to with another compliment more often than not the other person just wants gratitude and Mm. and I will say being in this field I have received more compliments than I ever have before in my life and it just feels so good because no one has to say anything nice Mm -hmm. to you and if they do it's because it genuinely just protrudes from them and yeah and so I love that and Um, and it's kind of a sign that you found your thing too yeah you know like when you're in the thing that like gives you joy and like just gives you that like excitement to wake up and do your thing that other people can tell that. And they want to tell you that they see that in you. Thank um, you. Now I am curious. Okay. I want to know, you know, you've had several years in this industry. Surely something crazy has happened to you. Oh, for sure. So I want to know what's your like wildest real estate story. Okay. So my wildest real estate story. Wow. It was in the beginning and it the was self, self-inflicted, <laughs> self-inflicted. So I was, I think, three months into being licensed and I was about to have my first closing. Mm-hmm. And this was a new construction, quick delivery home, meaning that it was already pretty much built by the time the, the buyer went under contract with the property mm-hmm. and the buyer was out of state. Um, 
And so he never saw the property in person. I only ever did virtual tours for the buyer. Which is nerve wracking. So nerve wracking for it to be my first. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm your eyes and ears. And so I, I go to one of the meetings with the builder and I realize the whole house is dusty and some parts are muddy. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, our closing is in just a few days. And I'm, and I'm scared for my buyer because they were going to come in person for the closing. So mm -hmm. I'm thinking this cannot be it. And I, I didn't know what was okay to say and what wasn't. And I probably should have asked my broker in charge at the time. <laughs> but anyway, I just got nervous. And so I already knew the code uh, to enter the property to, to get the key out of the lockbox. So later that day, I go home and I grab all my cleaning supplies. <laughs> Oh, oh, and you can probably imagine where the, the story is going. But I grab all my cleaning supplies, vacuum, mop, everything, dust, every, everything. So I fill up my car and then I go back to the house and I open the door with the key from the lockbox, which I had the code for. I did not make an appointment with anybody. So technically I trespassed. Oh. Um, I didn't make an appointment with anybody. Um, then it was really hot out and I had to put all the cleaning supplies in the home. So I decided to put my car in the garage and I closed the garage door. So no one could tell that there was anybody at this home. <laughs> and I start cleaning the whole house. Oh my goodness. I did. I cleaned the whole house thinking I cannot let my client arrive and see this. I had no clue at the time that new construction gets professionally cleaned like the day of closing, yeah. right before the final walkthrough. Um, my very first time. Oh my god! So it turns well, it got double professionally cleaned. Yes, it got <laughs> the so, professional cleaners got there and they were like, "Oh my gosh, this is going to be such an easy clean." <laughs> no, it was wild, and I don't even know how long I was there, but I was there for probably like a couple hours just oh cleaning my the whole place. And honestly, it was with good intentions. Yes. It was so innocent. I just wanted my client to have a clean home. Um, and then it turns out while I'm there, I'm almost finished. And I hear someone at the door and they're on the phone saying the key's not here. Like somebody <laughs> took the key. And I run up to the door with my cleaning supplies in hand. And it was the sales representative for the builder. They're like, you're not our contract. Right. <laughs> and I was like, hi, no, I'm just cleaning. And she's like, Wait, did you make an appointment? And I was like, no. And she's like, oh, you're not supposed to do, you're not supposed to come in without an appointment. Anyway, oh. she explained everything. And I said, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. She was like, I didn't even know that you were inside. And I said, well, I put my car in the garage because it was so hot. <laughs> <laughs> she's probably like completely in a, innocent mistakes. It was but so innocent. let me break it down for you. <laughs> yes. And I'm sitting there like holding the Windex and the rag. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I just and th in the back of her mind, she's like, you know what? I'm not really going to blast her because no. we just got the house clean for free. <laughs> <laughs> no, she she didn't blast me. She was so kind. She explained how things work. I told her it was my first time. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, never again. I honestly don't remember if I even told the buyer that story. But if oh he's watching. Hey, Chris. <laughs> If you guys ever do another transaction together, you should be like, hey, by the way, this time I'm not going to go in. Oh, my and gosh. Like, Wait, <laughs> I actually sold his house two years later. I sold his house, that same house. Yes. Hopefully you didn't go in and clean it for him. Mm -mm. Yeah, I learned I learned things. I learned things. But yeah, that's oh I think gosh. that's my wildest story just because it was so embarrassing and it was so naive, but it was so innocent. Yes, completely. <laughs> Uh, it kind of makes me laugh that you you told like the sales rep like this is my first closing because the first time I appeared in court it was for um, like a, a fairly it was an interesting have you ever heard of sovereign citizens no so they I'm not going to get too deep into it because the people that watch the channel might get fired up and disagree with what I say so I'm just <laughs> suffice it to say they um, kind of reject like the laws of the U S government that they have their own laws that they abide by. And a sovereign citizen had filed um, a document against a client of mine without a U.S. or North Carolina legal basis. They believed they had a legal basis for it, but North Carolina did not recognize that legal basis. So I had to go to court to try to get that document, like, stricken from the public records. And I get up there, and there's it's the very few people in the courtroom, really just other attorneys. And I say, Judge Crosswhite, uh, it is a pleasure to appear before you today. Um, this is my first time appearing before any judge. 
So please bear with me. Like, it wasn't exactly those words, but just I I felt like, let me just be honest about this because you're going to you're going to hear the nerves in my voice. And maybe let me tell you why. You know, I'm not expecting any sort of special treatment, but I I will say um, it was such a weird case that um, he ruled in my favor on like two of the three points. And the third one, he he very kindly said, I understand what you're asking for, but there is a better way to do this. And he didn't have to do that. And I think that probably helped with just being like, hey, this is my first time. I'm learning here. And um, like, that's what makes me think of when you say that. It makes me think of that of the like, that it can be helpful when you're like, I'm new to this. And we're going to get through this together. <laughs> right. I mean, and they had their first time at some point, too. Yes. Yeah. And know? hopefully someone showed them grace and, you know, they were passing it on. Exactly. Uh, now, when we have agents on, we like to give you an opportunity to ask. It's kind of like the ask an attorney. Like, if you've got any burning questions for, like, things that you encounter often or things that your clients ask you, um, just have at it. Ask me and I will do my best to answer. So do you have anything that you would like to ask? Well, I'm glad I get to ask a question of an attorney. (laughs) So I would love to know, not just for myself, but also for clients, what is your recommendation on how to hold the title of a property that is an investment property? So whether it be in a trust or an LLC or any other form. Mm -hmm. So I think that I'm going to make a very lawyer statement. It depends on the client's goals. Um, Ryan hates when I say it depends, but it always does. So that depends on if the client's goal is liability limitation or probate avoidance. So North Carolina is is odd. We, we are odd in a lot of ways, but one is that um, asset protection is not really a primary goal of the North Carolina legislature when it comes to property ownership and different entities. Uh, so we don't recognize a lot of like land trusts like other states do. Um, our land trusts are more for nonprofits, conservancies, et cetera. Um, so what you'd really be looking at is like a revocable trust. And a revocable trust is not going to um, protect your assets because you still have control over them. So in order for a trust to protect your assets, you basically can't have any control, interest, you know, anything like that with it, which basically makes it not yours anymore. So it'd have to be irrevocable and all sorts of other things that you have to do. Now, a trust will give you probate avoidance. So if your property is titled in the name of your trust and your primary goal is not having to have that property go for, through the probate process, then a trust is going to accomplish that for you. Um, but for a client that's looking primarily at limitation of liability, like someone who's got a vacation rental on the lake, um, you know, if somebody gets hurt there, then maybe they don't want their personal assets um, being affected by a judgment against them. That's where an LLC is going to be your best friend, provided all of the uh, formalities are observed. So, like, you can't commingle funds. You have to keep yourself separate from the LLC and, like, can't hold yourself to be out the LLC and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Another thing in North Carolina is, like, if you're making moves with your property or assets to try to get around creditors or um, trying to make yourself judgment-proof, North Carolina has this thing called the Uniform Voidable Transfers Act. So those moves can be challenged in order to make them like basically non-effective so that your assets can be affected by a judgment. So it really, if for most people, if they're trying to avoid probate, a trust is going to do that for you. Um, If you're trying to limit your liability, an LLC is going to do that for you. Um, But we don't really have a good vehicle that does both all at one time. Gotcha. Well, that is very insightful and also very confusing. So I'm sure that people have questions about that all the time. (laughs) They do. Yeah, they do. Um, This is plug for the YouTube channel. We got lots of videos about that. Um, So I just have to say I've greatly enjoyed this conversation. And I'm so glad that you took the time to come and join me today and talk about all of this stuff. Um, If you will please tell the people how they can find you online, where would you like people to follow you and how do they find you? Yes, they can find me on social media at The Selling Realtor on Instagram. And I believe that's my same handle on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I should probably know that for sure. (laughs) Um, But Instagram is probably the place where I'm most active and I love chatting. So I also love making friends. And I I really see this business as as a way for me to continuously make friends. So please reach out. Please, please, please reach out. Awesome. Well, thank you again for joining us today. I have so enjoyed this conversation and I look forward to getting to know you more.
I'm excited. Thank you so much. I appreciate you for having me. Thank you.